Alex Mashinsky, founder and CEO of the Celsius Network. Welcome back to Real Vision. Thanks, Ash. Uh, chapter two. So let's let's kick it off. Yeah, chapter two, indeed. We had a conversation about a year ago uh, where we discussed you have had a fascinating life before ever getting into uh, the blockchain, DeFi, CeFi space. Uh, I would urge anyone who hasn't already seen that interview to go check it out on Real Vision. I think it aired in December of 2020. So much to talk about here uh, today, the state of blockchain, the state of borrowing, lending, and yield, uh, Celsius's recent funding raise, and of course, the legal and regulatory framework that's happening around this space right now. Let's jump in, Alex, at the very beginning for people who haven't seen that interview. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your background. You're one of the few people to have experienced capitalism, socialism, and communism in your life. Give us a sense of how that shaped your view uh, of commerce, of banking, and of the financial world. Sure, yeah, it's a great opening. I, I you know, I think uh, these are all three experiments, right? Some of them are failing, some of them are just chugging along. And, and uh, even if you look at capitalism, we all think capitalism is the best uh, solution out of the three, but Capitalism today does not work for 99% of people living in America, right? Uh, not financially and not from a mental standpoint. And I think Corona kind of ha actually created almost like a reset, forcing all of us to think life work balance and all the things that we almost took for granted as a as the capitalist way. So having been born in, in communism in the Ukraine back in when it was part of the USSR, I lived in Israel, that's as, as socialist country as it gets. Uh, and uh, uh, coming to the United States and living the American dreams, right? Creating eight startups. I'm part of the 1%, it works great for me. But when I look around me, it's definitely not a, uh, the system that I envision the United States to be. And that's one of the reasons I created Celsius Network. Yeah, so as we talked about in the prior interview, you have a long history in the telecom space. Give us a sense of how you got interested in blockchain, in Bitcoin, and in this technology. So I'm a tech entrepreneur, uh, again, voice over IP. Uh, I built, uh, I, was, I was CEO of Novatel Wireless, built the first uh, 5G device in the United States for Verizon, uh, the MiFi 1000. So everything in my career, uh, put the wireless, uh, uh, 5G and uh, Wi-Fi in the wireless in the subway, transit wireless. So you look at my career, almost everything I've touched, we made things faster, better, and cheaper. So when I looked at Satoshi's paper in 2009, one of my friends showed it to me, uh, it was slower, more expensive, and it, and it was basically every 10 minutes, a transaction every 10 minutes, which made zero sense from kind of like the 30-year history, tech history uh, that I had. and and. I tried to put money over IP back in 2004. I created a startup that was attaching money to email and allowed you to send emails to each other, tried to bypass the banking system, and the regulars didn't like it uh, at all. So I did not solve the double spend problem, and I didn't recognize it when I met, when I read Satoshi's paper, I did not recognize that he solved the double spend problem. So it took me until 2013 to really understand that uh, something big is is happening and I need to really rethink all of my assumptions about the future of uh, fintech. So talk to us a little about Celsius, what the problem you were looking to solve is. Obviously, Celsius has been uh, doing this now in this space for some time. You recently raised, I think, $400 million uh, at Celsius uh, at a $3 billion or thereabouts valuation. Tell us a little bit how you got started with Celsius. Sure. So I dabbled in different coins, both as an investor and as a hodler, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on, so on. And and, uh, and so I, I think Bitcoin solves the store of value phenomenally well, but it did not solve many other problems. That's why Ethereum was created. And on top of it, I, I thought that yield is the second killer app, really the, the way that we're going to basically scale uh, or move from TradFi or traditional finance into uh, uh, this new revolution of, of decentralized finance, right? So uh, my focus was on, okay, what are the ways to create yield on different digital assets? And what is the business model that will make the most sense in a way that instead of replicating what Wall Street, all the business models that Wall Street uses, 
uh, to basically either manage funds or allocate uh, assets. What if we have an opportunity here to reinvent finance to the be- hopefully to make it better? So let's uh, put new rules and, and conditions so we don't replicate Wall Street, but we create something for the people by the people. Well, you know, you've been very eloquent talking about uh, some of the weak points in the traditional banking system. Give us a sense of how you think uh, of banking here in the United States and elsewhere in the developed world uh, right now. I know you've spoken about uh, the tremendous amount of revenue uh, and profit that uh, banks redistribute to their shareholders. Give us a little bit of a sense of that critique uh, and how you see that system. Right. So so in traditional finance, uh, uh, financial institutions, not just bank, but all forms of financial institutions act as trusted custodians as as uh, again the toll collectors the the they manage the transaction the exchange of assets or uh, uh currencies between different participants and uh, over time uh instead of uh, basically rewarding their customers they shifted more and more of these rewards toward their shareholders so if you look at today at JP Morgan or any of the major banks basically almost 100% of what they generate in income instead of going to customers as yield or as, as, as interest, it uh, goes to shareholders and executives as either dividends or stock buybacks or uh, bonuses. So, so that transfer assumes that customers have no choice and that they will stick with the bank or the financial institutions uh, no matter what the payout is. So it's okay to charge these customers uh, fees, right? All kind of fees. Uh, uh, and it's okay not to pay them any yield, uh, and that's just not uh, what the world looks like. I came to the United States 30 years ago, and I remember depositing uh, my dollars with Citi, and they paid me 7%. I didn't have to do anything, right? It was just that was the yield on your savings account. So really, we're just trying to bring that back. Yeah, you've talked about how people are just starving for yield right now. Uh, Give us a sense uh, of how you solve that problem. Specifically, you've talked about uh, how yield is the second killer app, the first being store of value. Uh, Tell us a little bit about how you generate yield at Celsius. Where does it come from? How does it work? Explain the mechanics. I did not invent yield. I just brought yield into digital assets, right? So yield obviously is something banks proudly display every quarter in their financial filings with the SEC. Anyone can see what is return on capital, what is, uh, you know, what is the multiple of, uh, you know, in the fractional reserve system and so on, so on. So uh, that's how financial institutions and banks earn uh, income, right? They basically create income on the assets that they have. And uh, uh, that turns into yield as a percentage of their uh, existing assets. So, so the the way to do this uh, in crypto is not any different, right? So, so we basically uh, took ideas like uh, securities lending or sec lending from the traditional world, uh, arbitrage, uh, market making, all these activities that are standard activities in financial markets, and brought them into uh, digital assets. The big difference is that instead of trying to reward the shareholders. Here, most of these benefits, most of the yield created or the value created on these assets uh, goes to the participants in the network. So we have about 1.2 million users from over 170 countries. We aggregated over $30 billion of their digital assets. And any institution or exchange that wants to borrow those pays us yield. And we just share most of that with our community. Alex, I don't want to take anything for granted here. We have lots of folks at Real Vision who come to us from the financial side, but also folks who come to us from the tech side. So for people who aren't familiar with SEC lending, arbitrage, and market making, break that down for us and give us a sense of why it generates yield and exactly how that happens. Right. So again, it's not a new idea. Uh, uh, institutional Wall Street have been using it for a very long time. Uh, it's, it's a very simple process. Your broker-dealer sells you your Apple shares or your... Uh, uh, your, your Google shares, and you use them for custody, right? So they basically uh, are re- retain that asset. And as long as you click a little button that says, I want to have a margin account, the minute you click on that, you give them permission, even if you didn't borrow anything, you give them permission to rehypothecate or lend out 
your underlying asset, right? And and in this case, it would be again the Apple share or the uh, uh, Google share. So who wants to borrow these assets? Market makers, exchanges, and other institutions who basically use the uh, leverage, right, to create markets. So they basically participate in different on different exchanges that participate in market making arbitrage and other activities and through that they generate yield but to be able to have that leverage they borrow these assets from prime brokers and the prime brokers in most cases are the people you bought your shares from so you get to uh, buy that share with no fee right right now most brokers give you the transaction with no fee but in exchange they make money on the securities lending by lending these to Citadel or whoever is the is the a market maker that is operating on that specific stock. Yeah, so individuals and institutions pay uh, to borrow shares. Uh, there are differences in price uh, across different uh, across different markets, uh, and um, you have large people uh, people who are doing these transactions in size who are making markets in them who can take advantage of the buy uh, of the bid ask spreads as people buy and sell. So Fidelity, Charles Schwab, all these guys, interactive brokers, they all make uh, money from this. In most cases, they don't share it with you, right? So unless you're a large institution or a large family offices and you actually negotiate to get part of that SEC lending income, you will not see Fidelity send you a check at the end of the quarter and say, wow, you know, you have uh, $10,000 worth of Tesla. Guess what? The borrow on Tesla right now is about 30%. So they gave you four, uh, you saved $4.95, but you could have made $3,000 on just SEC lending if you kept all of that value by lending the shares to short sellers or to our, uh, market makers. Yeah, and because the short interest is high in stocks that are very volatile, you can see those uh, those ratios of, uh, of payouts get to very high numbers. Uh, and that, again, all accrues to uh, traditional financial institutions who are involved in those activities. Uh, and again, to your point, Alex, this isn't something new. This isn't something that you invented at Celsius. This is just the way the world works uh, in the traditional finance side. Uh, but those profits are uh, disproportionately uh, pushed up to, I guess, management uh, in the form of bonuses and compensation and also uh, to shareholders. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's just the way the system functions today. Well, the, the heresy was me revealing the secret and then deciding to take all that yield and give it to the community. That was the heresy. That's what, you know, the kind of like uh, uh, really crossing the line. Uh, uh, and uh, we've paid over a billion dollars now, right, in, in, in yield, uh, which is a phenomenal number. Uh, and and that's, why, well, that's why it's such a, that's why Celsius is such a big success, right? So tell us a little bit about the token and how that integrates into this ecosystem, the sell token. So there are 12,000 tokens out there. Uh, uh, they're all trying to solve some problem. They all represent uh, some kind of activity on the blockchain. So for example, Ethereum has the ETH uh, and obviously it represents, uh, uh, if you own ETH in one way or another, you are basically part of that ecosystem and part of the volume or transaction volume or dollar volume going through that uh, blockchain. So at Celsius, we decided to create a, a limited supply token. So uh, we don't have any inflation. We don't mint more and more uh, sell. Uh, uh, so even Bitcoin or Ethereum have inflation, right? They continue to, to mine uh, new tokens. And the value in the token is the fact that you can basically earn, and this is again, was innovation that Celsius created before DeFi, before uh, hundreds of other companies have copied of what we've done. It was the first time you could earn yield in kind, Bitcoin on your Bitcoin, or you could earn uh, sell the yield in sell, and you got up to 30% more yield if you chose to earn in sell instead of earning in kind. And and now you're seeing many other companies like Compound and Ave and others basically doing the same thing, trying to boost their yield by issuing uh, tokens. But at Celsius, we actually generate the yield from uh, actual commercial activity, not from farming and not from the yield, the token inflation, because we don't have any inflation, but rather from actual uh, income that we generate from our counterparties who pay us yield. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Ave uh, and some of the others. There's this uh, question out there, particularly for people who are relatively new to the space, uh, trying to understand the distinction between uh, DeFi uh, and Celsius. 
um, you know, there's the term of art that's used sometimes, uh, C5 versus DeFi. Give us a sense of how you think about that more broadly. We see uh, C uh, DeFi or decentralized finance as a subset of the entire uh, yield industry. And the reason it's a subset is because Celsius is uh, one of the largest participants in DeFi, right? But we, we, we have six legs to the stool, six legs, each one generating its own yield. Only one of the legs is DeFi, right? Is basically lending on fully decentralized exchanges that are governed by uh, a smart contracts, right? So uh, we lend, when we lend to an institution, we have a bilateral agreement and it's similar to what uh, you do with ISDA on traditional, uh, in traditional markets. We also lend to exchanges. Uh, we have a mining operation. So by minting new Bitcoin, we're creating yield or creating income that pays uh, yield to our community. And uh, uh, we obviously also uh, have other activities that, that generate yield. So altogether, uh, Celsius created a very stable yield. If you look at the payout on, uh, at Celsius, it's been very stable for four years. And when you look at the payout on DeFi, one day it's uh, 11% and the next day it's 2%, right? So it's very unpredictable because it completely depends on how many uh, borrowers showed up that day for that asset. And in most cases, when you look at how much they have an asset locked, for example, if you go on Compound and you look, okay, how much Ethereum do they have locked versus how much is being lent out, uh, you will see a very low ratio, meaning only 20 or 30% of the assets are lent out, where at Celsius, we're always maintaining over 80% of the assets being lent out. So the efficiency or the velocity of money uh, on Celsius is much greater or much higher than it is on uh, pure DeFi. And because of that, Celsius has paid multiples. I'm talking about 10 times more than anybody else in the crypto world. Yeah, let's give us a sense of what those rates are. Let's talk a little bit about APY. I know these vary by supply and demand, but give us a sense of where we are with that today. Yeah, so stable coins are uh, the highest paying right now, 8.8% .8 on USDC or USDT or uh, PAX uh, standard or U uh, TUSD. So we support 13 different stable coins from all the major issuers. And uh, the reason, that the rate itself, the 8.8%, uh, really is an indicator of the uh, lack of supply, of the scarcity of dollars in the DeFi and CeFi systems, right? So the rate goes up when demand is greater than supply, and the rate shrinks when supply is greater than demand. And basically, uh, but the rate itself indicates to you how much shortage there is. So right now, I would estimate that there's probably anywhere between 20 and $50 billion worth of sh shortage, right? Lack of funds in the DeFi world uh, that that basically dictates that rates are high, right? If all that money showed up, rates would probably drop to three or 4%. You know, by the way, obviously, if you're looking at rates in the eight, eight plus, eight and a half plus uh, percent range compared to something like a, a CD, uh, which is currently earning, I guess, like 50 or 75 basis points, that's uh, 0.5 or 0.75%, 0.75%, uh, obviously quite low. Let's talk, Alex, about some of the risks uh, inherent in this process. Obviously uh, not FDIC insured, uh, but give us a sense of how you think about those risks. Yeah, so Celsius is uh, lending, uh, basically most of our loans are uh, fully collateralized. Some of them are partially collateralized. It really depends on the size of the counterparty. And uh, we have uh, tier one institutions with billions of dollars on their balance sheet borrowing from us. Uh, the largest loan we've done was $100 million in a single transaction. And uh, uh, so when you look at the yield you can get, let's say, let's take uh, uh, junk bonds, right? So if you look at, you, you earn, I don't know, three or four, three and a half or four percent, maybe four and a half percent, but you're taking something that is actually very risky here, you're earning twice as much, but it's fully backed or almost fully backed with liquid assets, right? So our collateral will be, if we're lending stable coins, would be Bitcoin or Ethereum or some other uh, very liquid asset. And in four years, and we're talking about uh, tens of thousands of loans, we have not had a single institutional liquidation, forced liquidation. We had tens of thousands of margin calls. 
but not a single counterparty has defaulted uh, uh, on their loan. So we only lend to really responsible institution. You can't say that about junk bonds, right? Obviously, we had tremendous amount of liquidations in junk bonds. So here, you can earn double the yield, but you're taking less risk uh, than some of the most traditional markets uh, out there. You talked about uh, the, the fluctuation, the dollar shortage uh, right now in the space being a cause of higher yield. Uh, give us a sense of, of how exactly that works in terms of mechanics, how the supply and demand uh, for uh, loanable funds for the underlying digital assets sets the rate of yield. Yeah, so currently none of the prime brokers, traditional prime brokers, uh, lend into this market. So you have uh, basically shortage of liquidity. We're, while there's tremendous amount of liquidity uh, o o on the security side, right? If you're a broker dealer or you are a, a hedge fund, you can basically easily get five to one leverage uh, from most prime brokers. Uh, you can't get any of that today in uh, in DeFi or in CFI, right? So. So the, the total leverage for Celsius is 1.25, I think, right now. Okay, total for the entire organization, right? So, so we are, uh, uh, and 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 that's why when you look at, uh, uh, we already had two stress tests, right? One was May of 2021, one was March of 2020, and in both of them, we did not require the Fed or any outside agency to come and bail out the entire industry, or provide liquidity, or jump into the repo market or anything like that. So the lack of leverage is uh, what keeps uh, this uh, uh, industry going. And uh, because of the, there's no bridges, right, between traditional finance and DeFi or CeFi, uh, the scarcity is what keeps yields high. But normally, uh, if you wanna enter the uh, CeFi or DeFi market, you have to go to an issuer of stable coins. So for example, Circle or Tether, and you would give them your fiat currencies, and in exchange, they will give you a stable coin like USDC or USDT, which you can transfer into Celsius. We will pay you yield about for it, and we then in turn lend that to institutions who pay us higher yield, right? So that's kind of the, the rotation from uh, uh, fiat money into digital money and into these markets. Now, you have to know where you're putting your money in. If you put your money in a DeFi pool, it may pay 18%, but there's a chance that the pool will be, uh, there'll be a rug pool, meaning people who created the pool will run away with your money, or there's a bug and somebody can come in and steal all the money from that pool, which happened many times. So one of the hardest things for uh, people to do is really know, okay, which yield is real yield and which yield is is very risky yield. And that's what Celsius really specializes in. So we have, you know, I would say 90% of that uh, uh, or 80% of that 30 billion is deployed. And a big chunk of that, several billion dollars is deployed in, in DeFi earning yield. And we have not had any rug pulls or any uh, uh, situations where we lost funds because we are very careful uh, uh, where we allocate capital. So for people who are just getting their heads around this right now, walk us through uh, what a typical scenario would look like with a counterparty, uh, what, a, what the typical amounts are, how you do the uh, credit analysis, uh, and how you actually execute the transaction. Sure. So a counterparty would be, uh, again, either an institution or a hedge fund. Normally, they'll manage uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars. They'll have a very uh, a, a solid balance sheet, and they'll, they can share with us uh, both the balance sheet and their, the fact that they're profitable. It's very important for us uh, that they've been around for, for a while. And they would basically sign an MLA or, or a master loan agreement with us. Uh, uh, and normally it's a two-way agreement, so we can borrow from them or they can borrow from us. And uh, then they would tell us, okay, we need, uh, we, we're doing a Bitcoin ARB between uh, Coinbase and Binance, and we need Bitcoin and we need USDT. Okay, and we need uh, $20 million of each, right? Uh, and, and we would provide those funds. Normally, they will give us some kind of collateral against that, against the Bitcoin and, and the cash we provide. It will be in a different form. Otherwise, it wouldn't need to borrow from us. And uh, they would run that trade. Usually, they would run that trade for two or three months, and we would keep the loan open. When the loan closes, they return the funds. We return the collateral. We charge them interest and we move on, move those funds to the next borrower. So, so give us a sense of what that collateral 
typically consists of? Is it U.S. Treasuries? Is, uh, is it something else? Uh, and what the percentage of collateralization is, just as a range, so people can get their head around this. We have two businesses. We have a retail lending and we have uh, institutional lending. On a retail lending, you can only borrow up to 50% LTV, loan to value. So if you have Bitcoin, you, the, max, the maximum you can get, if you have one Bitcoin and it's 66,000, you will not get more than $33,000 or stable coins. And that provides a price buffer in the case that the, the price moves against uh, the, the person who's borrowing. That's correct, right. In other words, if the Bitcoin, uh, the underlying collateral drops in value, you've got a 50% capital cushion uh, against which uh, to liquidate in the event that there is a dramatic decrease in price. That's right. And, and our average book right now is below 30%, right? So we have many, many people taking 25% LTV, 33% LTV. They're not... These borrowers are not uh, high vol traders who need uh, high leverage, right? So they normally want to pay off a credit card or they uh, don't want to sell the asset and pay taxes. So they want to defer their taxes. They just want to borrow against the asset. So that's the retail side. I was just going to say, in an environment where the price of the underlying is rising dramatically, you can imagine someone uh, who made a small investment in Bitcoin. They wake up one morning, they find they have a hundred thousand dollar position in Bitcoin. They still have, uh, you know, fifteen thousand dollars worth of student loans outstanding. Uh, they want to borrow that money because they want to do something with the capital without liquidating the position, without selling the position, uh, so that they can uh, effectively meet their cash obligation, their cash flow obligation, while still continuing to participate uh, in the upside of that trade by holding the asset. Exactly. And, and many of these people pay 24% on their credit card, right? So it makes a lot of sense uh, to borrow from us. Our 25% LTV loans are 1% interest rate uh, a year, right? So it's a very effective way to reduce your credit card debt and borrow against that uh, uh, equity that you created uh, in Bitcoin or Ethereum or one of the other assets. So uh, on the institutional side, the, <clears throat> the, those are much shorter term transactions and, and the the, they may change the asset uh, several times a month, right? So they might jump from Bitcoin to Ethereum or to Litecoin or to some other asset or one inch, all right? We support 45 different assets on 15 different blockchains, right? So that's the most anyone supports out there. And uh, that allows uh, institutions to be very opportunistic and very dynamic. And in most cases, again, their service also helps the retail user because it tightens spreads, it normalizes prices across many, many exchanges, and it actually performs a very good function for the market. So, uh, uh, so if you're a retail user and you don't understand how this stuff works, uh, uh, these uh, market makers and hedge funds uh, even though they make a lot of money themselves, they also help you get fair price because without them, there will be much more disparity between exchanges and between uh, uh, different uh, providers. Yeah. And we were also talking about the institutional side. Walk us through that. Yeah. So institutions, in most cases, will uh, use collateral that they don't need. So if, if, I have, uh, if I'm borrowing ETH and I have plenty of Bitcoin that I own on my balance sheet, I will give it to Celsius as collateral and I will borrow ETH and stable coins to basically do an ARB or do market making or whatever the activity is. Or for example, I, I might be uh, uh, going short a, a future contract and I want to, I have to go long a, um, uh, the underlying, so I have to go long Bitcoin or Ethereum and the best pair is a USDT ETH pair. That's the cheapest way to buy that asset. Uh, and I don't want to have USDT on my balance sheet. I will borrow USDT. I might give Celsius dollars and borrow USDT. The, the, the reason for that is that my uh, compliance department doesn't want me to, have, to, to own USDT. I can borrow USDT, but I don't want to own it on my balance sheet. So there are all kinds of reasons why people do what they do. For us, the most important thing is, is this a credible counterparty? Are they going to repay their... Uh, balances, are they going to return the uh, return the assets? Are they going to pay the interest? And that's what we care about. We care less about uh, their activity. Obviously, if somebody just does naked short on Bitcoin, we would be very concerned. And uh, so we don't we don't lend to small hedge funds or trying to take directional bets. Uh, but most of our customers are not in that business. 
What, what sort of uh, businesses are most of your customers in? Exchanges, market making, uh, 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 you know, again, uh, uh, derivatives, right? So that's, again, all the traditional lines of business that you see on Wall Street, they just hear uh, the volatility is much higher, right? The volatility in crypto is dramatic. It's it's 80 vol every day of the week compared to traditional markets. So it doesn't matter if you're in FX or equities or bonds, uh, your ability to generate alpha or generate yield uh, is dramatically better in crypto. And that's why you're seeing some of the brightest minds uh, from Wall Street migrating uh, to crypto because the opportunity is so much greater. So we we are the... We provide the shovels and the and the picks to to all these people. We don't take positions ourselves, and we might hedge once in a while, but in most cases, we just provide the underlying uh, to all the different participants, so they can do their traditional market making activities. Yeah, and speaking of traditional, this is a traditional credit underwriting function that you're engaging in by effectively examining balance sheets, cash flow, uh, all the usual financial metrics that you would associate with credit underwriting uh, to do your analysis to understand uh, what the leverage ratio should be and what the risk profile is of the borrower, particularly on the institutional side. Yeah, and, and so our credit department is larger than most DeFi uh, projects in total. Like we have more employees just in our credit department than most of these platforms and most of the DeFi uh, platforms uh, uh, hired in total. So it's a different function, right? I mean, we, uh, as, a, as a centralized finance organization, uh, we have much more responsibility and uh, uh, versus, uh, again, a smart contract where you can just get liquidated 10 minutes after you put your money into it. So for us, a relationship with these counterparties are very important. And, and that's why we continuously both monitor them, but also manage the position, right? We will force them to reduce the position or add more collateral uh, f to make sure that they don't blow up or don't get out of the range that we're comfortable with. And that's how we manage to have zero uh, forced liquidations in four years, right? So I don't think if you talk to any DeFi platform, they'll talk to you about thousands of liquidations that they had. They almost brag about how quickly they liquidate their customers. We brag about the fact that we don't have to liquidate any of our customers. You mentioned that range uh, of collateralization. What does that look like at the high level? So I think the, uh, the more volatile the asset, the more uh, uh, collateral we require. So if you're borrowing something that uh, uh, tr uh, moves up and down 30, 40, 50%, in a 24-hour period, we may require even over 200% collateralization, right? So, so the the vol on each asset is different. The the history, the duration, how long this asset has been trading, and we normally don't add assets unless they've been in the market for at least a year. We need that history to be able to price our risk and 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 hedge if we need to. Uh, but most of our volume, I would say, is concentrated in that Bitcoin, Ethereum, stablecoin uh, range. And over there, it would be anywhere between, I would say, 80% for the very large institution to 150% uh, for the smaller institutions. We talked a little bit about stable coins. Give us a sense on where you see the most demand, where you see the greatest shortages right now. Yeah, so for those who don't know, uh, uh, the Bitcoin uh, uh, Tether uh, pair slash the Bitcoin Ethereum pair, the, 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 the USDT pair, uh, trades more than any of the other coins put together. I mean, you, you can take the Bitcoin volume and the Ethereum volume, and the Ether, the USDT volume is higher than the two of them put together, right? So, so that is by far the largest uh, um, demand is for USDT, and uh, um, uh, the it, there is not enough liquidity there, right? So the velocity of money uh, on USDT is about 22 times a day, right? So the same coin would switch hands or token would switch hands up to 20 something times a day. The velocity of money on the US dollar is 1.2. So, so crypto is 20 times more liquid, right? And more efficient, more uh, uh, the GDP is created in crypto 20 times faster than it is created on average in the US economy. Now, in 1990, the velocity of the dollar was 2.6. So we've been decreasing since, since the 90s uh, almost every year. And uh, again, most of the GDP we generate today is done through financial engineering and not through actual uh, uh, you know, economic activity. 
So for people who may not be familiar uh, with USDT, with Tether, uh, obviously USDT is not the only stable coin out there. Uh, USDC uh, from Circle, for example, regulated onshore in the US. Give us a sense of, of why USDT is so popular. Well, first, it was the first one to launch, right? Or second one to launch, I should say. And, and, and uh, it, it is entrenched in many, uh, on many exchanges and volume goes to volume is, right? And, and so if the volume is on USDT BTC, uh, then more people show up there because the, the spreads are tighter, the prices are better, and so on, so on. So, so being first helps a lot. And uh, also a lot of uh, foreign users don't have access to dollars. So USDT is one of the only ways they can participate in these markets. So because of the scarcity of dollars outside the United States. Um, so there's a lot of reasons, but uh, Tether has been uh, doing very well. Uh, but uh, Circle is catching up very fast and it definitely, I think the growth on Circle has been higher, faster uh, than the growth uh, on, on uh, Tether. But for Circle, most of the activity is the on-ramp activity, right? It's people from traditional finance trying to get into DeFi or CeFi using uh, Circle as their entry point. And, and we do a lot of uh, business with Circle, with uh, USDC, so definitely very attractive option, and uh, it's in Bermuda, but it's uh, I think it's like a, a they, they all publish their uh, financial uh, information, so you can actually check very clearly to see what the, what it is backed by, how much is U.S. Treasuries, how much is cash, where that money is kept, and so on, so on. Yeah, uh, obviously there have been questions about some of the other coins and their collateralization. Uh, overseas commercial paper and some questions about the quality of that collateral uh, that have been reported uh, elsewhere, certainly. Um, so, Alex, we've geeked out here on the finance and economic aspect of this. Let's geek out a little bit now on the technical aspect. Tell us a little bit uh, about why you chose uh, ERC-20 tokens uh, and how that works uh, as the backbone of, uh, of Celsius. You have to think about uh, different blockchain as highways, right? And and you can think one highway is a six-lane highway and one highway is a four-lane highway. And some highways only allows cars, some other highway allows trucks. So really, the, the analogy is that you want to participate in or, or, or make sure your car uh, drives on the highway that has the most uh, traffic on it and has uh, basically uh, the most destinations. Right, and the Ethereum network today by far is the highway with the most destinations, uh, off ramps and on ramps, and so on, so on. And and for Celsius, creating a, yet another highway to compete with this highway was just not a good option. So we decided. Uh, uh, so we, again, blockchains that have their own highway uh, issue coins. So that's why Ethereum is a coin. And if you ride on somebody else's uh, highway, like Celsius, that is a token. A lot of people. Uh, uh, confuse the two. And an NFT, a non-fungible token, can be a coin because if it has its own uh, uh, highway, its own blockchain, like uh, CryptoKitties, for example, right now have, that is a non-fungible coin, not, not a non-fungible token. So, so, uh, so Celsius decided to really ride on uh, the Ethereum network. We needed all those on-ramps, off-ramps. We needed uh, compatibility. Uh, with everybody else. But like I said before, we support 15 different highways. So you want to come to us on the Cardano highway or you want to come to us on the Litecoin highway and transact there, no problem. You want to borrow there, no problem. So we support all different denominations. We don't believe in building castles like building another Solana or building another Cardano, but rather building the roads and bridges between all the different uh, castles, right? Between all these different highways. So that's really the specialty of Celsius, providing liquidity, uh, creating markets, uh, and enabling all the other participants to perform their uh, financial functions. The cell token itself, though, is an ERC-20 token, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so, so our token runs on Ethereum, uh, uh, but we also support Ethereum native assets like ETH and others. Layer one, layer two, and so on. So they're, they they come in different colors: red trucks, uh, yellow trucks, blue trucks, and so on. So let's talk a little bit about the regulatory framework. This is a big conversation, something that many investors have seen uh, as perhaps the principal uh, headwind right now in the digital asset space. 
uh, you know, a couple of notes here. Uh, first, uh, I should say from a filming perspective, we're filming this on the afternoon of Thursday, October 21st. This interview goes live on the Real Vision platform uh, on November 1st. So that's 11 days from now. Uh, obviously, this is a fast moving space. Lots of things can happen between now and then. Uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about what's been happening recently. Uh, there were some internet rumors that the office of the New York Attorney General uh, had issued a, a cease and desist letter to Celsius. Celsius has denied that rumor, uh, talked about uh, how the AG office uh, rather received or processed a request uh, for more information uh, from Celsius. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening. I know there have been some challenges, uh, and I think New Jersey, Texas, and Alabama as well. Uh, let's talk about the general framework for what's happening here. Uh, from a legal standpoint, this revolves around uh, whether or not uh, this functionality that we've been discussing here is or is not a security uh, under something called the Martin Act. This is obviously very technical legal uh, analysis here. But Alex, give us the overview of what's happening right now and how you see it. Yeah, so it's a very good question because uh, uh, most crypto, crypto started as this uh, rebellious uh, cypherpunks, anti-establishment platform and any collaboration or cooperation with regulators or traditional finance was considered heresy, right? So, uh, but we've evolved since. Bitcoin is now 13 years old. And in most uh, most companies today, one way or another, are working with regulators, right? And, and the asset class has grown to two and a half trillion or more, uh, which basically is large enough for regulators to pay attention to. When this was just a collector item, that's how people viewed Bitcoin back in 2010. It was just like collecting Beanie Babies or collecting, uh, 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 you know, cards. It was just a digital collector collection. And there was no need for regulation, but today, you have a derivatives market, you have a spot market, you have a, a options market and so on. Uh, so uh, regulators are paying a lot of attention to this industry. And it all comes down to really a very simple question, right? Should unaccredited investors, people who we don't think based on the 1940 Act, who don't have the necessarily the expertise or the knowledge uh, to participate in this market, should be, they be allowed to benefit from these type of services or should it be regulated and supervised by traditional financial activities such as the CFTC, SEC, and so on, so on. So, so we, we don't have an answer for that. It's not, there has never been a statement from, mo from any regulator, almost anywhere in the world that clarified this issue, right? So what everybody's waiting for is uh, uh, exactly that, right? It, and in many cases, some of the regulators are pointing to the lawmakers and say, hey, I'm just interpreting the 1940 Act. You want to change the rules, go, go get a new law that clarifies how do we treat digital assets, right? So, but I want to clarify that, that I don't see, and, and we've been behaving this way since 2017 when we launched Celsius, that we don't see any conflict between being fully compliant and providing all these services. Celsius voluntarily filed uh, uh, Reg D with the SEC in 2018. We've since filed, I think, filed it once or twice again. We filed with FinCEN. We are uh, obviously cooperating with the IRS and other agencies where we have to report either 1099s or other types of, of activity. So we are performing all of the required uh, uh, regulation that we know of. I mean, if somebody wants to point out to something we missed, uh, I have three law firms. <laughs> <laughs> will tell me every day what I need to do. But uh, we think that we are within the laws and all of these requests uh, uh, from the states you mentioned uh, were mo for more information, right? How are you doing this? How are you doing that? How do you manage risk? And so on, so on, right? Because I think the nightmare for any regulator is that somebody who grew uh, to billions of dollars in, in assets makes a mistake and people get hurt and then everybody calls uh, the local attorney general or whatever and says, Where, why weren't you watching over these guys, right? So that's really, I think, the main concern. So part of our raise uh, of this 400 million was also to show uh, regulators and, and others that uh, we can raise money very quickly, right, if we need to. And uh, it wasn't because we needed funds. It was more about demonstrating that we have good parents, right? Obviously, Cassette de Poe, Westcap are just phenomenal names to have uh, on, on our cap table. And uh, uh, we are looking for regulators everywhere to basically help us navigate this. Obviously, 
like I said, Celsius uh, did a lot of good, right? Our slogan, our, our, uh, in, our motto is uh, do good, then do well. That's what we live by. So uh, uh, we don't think there's anyone who got hurt from using Celsius, right? Because all we do is take an asset you already own and pay you more on it. You have sugar, great. Here's more sugar on your sugar since Bitcoin and Ethereum is supposed to be a commodity. So, so that's really how we view it. But I think the whole industry is in this contentious mode with regulators. And we think that the longer that lasts, the worse it's going to be. The longer it's going to take us as an asset class uh, to become, uh, have an equal seat at the table with all the other asset classes. Yeah, this is such a fascinating conversation. We could talk about this for three hours alone. I think one of the things that makes uh, this space so overwhelming in some sense for people who are new to it to get their head around is that you basically, it's the union of three incredibly complicated areas. So it's finance and economics. Uh, it's really interesting uh, distributed um, IP type of, uh, of, of, of technology. And then on top of that, you have the complexity uh, of the legal, regulatory, and compliance aspect of it. For people who are maybe on the technology side who aren't familiar with this, it, here in the United States alone, for example, you have competing federal regulators, uh, you, have, uh, you have state regulators, you have state attorney generals. Uh, I mean, it is just an incredibly complicated space for people to get their head around. And you know, one of the things that's so interesting to me uh, is I uh, you know, frequently talk to people who, who are good actors, who desperately want to comply uh, with the law, with all of the uh, relevant uh, regulations and rules uh, by SEC, CFTC, and some of the other regulators, and of course, by the state regulators. But as you point out, there's just not clarity or guidance. There's not the safe harbor for people who are trying to do these things uh, the proper way. It must be a very interesting uh, sort of experience to be in the middle of this uh, at this incredibly early stage of the game. For sure. And, and again, put on top of that financial innovation, which is what we do every day, and, and you really are uh, uh, a trailblazing a whole new path that most regulators just don't know. They have to use rules from 1940 to apply to, to, to internet and technology and digital assets, obviously those rules just cannot be used in any effective way. So there's a lot of interpretation, a lot of kind of uh, uh, derivative of the original law that was written where you actually had to deliver a physical certificate or receive a physical certificate from your broker, right? Even the DTCC didn't exist back then. So. So all these things are, are obviously not, we're not written for this world, right? So, so I think, but, but really what we have to focus on is something very, very simple, right? I mean, what, what Celsius is doing and how many other people are trying to copy us is that it's delivering all that value for the user, right? So the rules are pretty simple when a bank or financial institution keeps all of it to themselves, they don't give anything to anybody else and they've been doing the same thing for 100 or 200 years. But here you have a new animal, right? That is actually acting in the best interest of its customers. And why are we so generous, right? It's because fast growing companies like ours, and we, we are, I think, the fastest in history to reach 30 billion in AUM, right? In less than three years, right? We've reached 30 billion in AUM. So the multiple that a company like ours will get on our growth are much better than the multiples we will get if we were just a bank or financial uh, institution, right? Because those traded 10 to 15 times multiples. So it's actually in our best interest to act in the best interest of the community. And that's the piece that most people just don't understand. Most people go like, wait a second, why are you giving so much money back to the community? Two reasons. One, I'm the largest user of Celsius. I have $300 million of my own money on the platform collecting yield. And second, it's good for me. I'm the largest shareholder of Celsius and the multiples I'll get on this company will be much better than if I tried to copy the old business uh, of Wall Street. Doing good by doing well. Uh, by the way, talking about old models, the reason uh, for those who are not lawyers, uh, when you're mentioning uh, this year 1940, that's in reference to the Investment Company Act of 1940, which is some of the founding legislation 
uh, around securities laws in the United States. Just to give you an idea of how long some of this uh, takes to shake out, the Act of 1940, as it's usually referred to by lawyers, uh, is in response in large measure to the crash of 1929. So you're talking about 11 years to figure out the structure uh, of how to regulate securities markets. Uh, and oh, by the way, things were changing far more slowly uh, in the 30s than they are today. Totally. And again, digital assets are a different animal. Okay. They are partially uh, regulated by the CFTC. They're partially, there may be securities if you use them in a certain way, right? They touch currencies. So they're like, they have, it's, it's, it's like a quantum state where you are in all places at the same time, right? <laughs> so, so we have no clue. You know, a regulator comes and says, wait a second, what are you? Are you this, this, and that? And we're like, well, we don't know. You tell us, you know? So, so we all just asking for clarity, right? And and the the key issue is here is our regulators going to uh, protect and enforce uh, things that are good for the customers, or are they going to defend the incumbents? I think it all comes down to that, right? And Hester P is so the SEC commissioner said it best. She said it's not the job of the regulator, in this case the SEC, to protect the incumbents, right? And that's really what. The, the cooks of the matter is, will Gensler and others help uh, move this, right? Move innovation forward. Will we leap into the future or are we going to cling to the past uh, by basically saying that all these things have to be under the old umbrella of securities? Alex, please don't tell regulators that the Howey test is like Schrodinger's cat. You're going to melt <laughs> lawyers' brains. Yes, well, it is. It is a little bit of fuzzy logic, right? I mean, it's not a. It's not a simple yes or no. And and again, the industry is moving so fast that uh, it's very difficult to even pinpoint and say, okay, here is how it works. Let's just frame this. Uh, this the pace of innovation in CFI and DeFi is hundreds of times faster than the banks. You know, they all joke about banks. The last thing they invented was the ATM machine. So, so that's where what we're competing with. Alex, it's been a wide ranging conversation about finance and economics, technology, uh, the law and this industry in general. Final thoughts you'd like to leave our audience with. Yeah, so again, this is uh, uh, a retail uh, uh, led revolution, right? Uh, crypto started as a, uh, again, cypherpunks and then migrated to libertarians. Then it was a kind of uh, a combination of uh, uh, speculators and and only now the institutions are coming in right this last wave is mostly driven by institutions but really the growth has been all retail uh, driven right so so it's important for all of us to first support it if you want your coins to be worth more it's all about getting other people involved and educating them on the benefits of assets that have any scarcity obviously in this world where uh, we, we we're printing trillions of dollars like never before. Uh, something that is scarce has uh, a chance for increasing in value. But it's important that, again, that as the institutions come in, we don't forget why this industry was born. What was Satoshi's dream uh, uh, in creating Bitcoin? And obviously since then, Ethereum and other assets. And I really hope that the next few hundred million people who join get to benefit from this, get to see financial freedom, financial independence. And I'm writing a book about that, which should publish by early next year, that covers all of these things and, and hopefully uh, gives you some more color on, on my thoughts about the, the, these matters. Alex, do you have a title yet? It's probably going to be Unbank Yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, a, a really intriguing conversation. I think that was the clearest explanation that I've ever heard uh, about uh, securities lending, arbitrage, uh, and market making. And, and the role that it plays uh, is the lifeblood of the uh, financial brokerage system in the United States, and specifically about how that applies to DeFi. A truly intriguing conversation. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks for having me again, and I look forward to chapter number three. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone.